Yeah, man. American Holocaust. Contra. Page 212. When first contacted by Europeans in the early years of exploration, the two Penamba were described as the most handsome and best proportioned people in the world virtually creatures of perfection. They were, said Pedro Vaz da Camina in 1500, people of, quote, fine bodies and good faces as to good men, and a kind of generous people of innocence and pure simplicity to boot, an imaginative Portuguese painting of an adoration of the Magi from this time even replaced one of the traditional wise men with young and handsome representative of these Brazilian natives. Replete with distinctive feature feather headdress and gold earrings, bracelets, and anklets. At almost this same time, however, Woodcut illustrations began appearing in other parts of Europe, depicting the Brazilians as cannibals and sexual libertines. And by the 1550s, when Brazil was in the process of being denuded of its native people by European slavery, violence and imported diseases, those very same gold and feather to Pinamba decorations could be found adorning the head and body of Satan in other Portuguese painting. A grotesque and horrible, horrific portrait of the devil's inferno. Meanwhile, in concert with the change in visual representation, European writers had now taken to calling these lately dubbed Brazilian paragons of pure virtue and simplicity, quote, beast in human form, to quote Nicholas Duran de Velagan Ganan. Such ideological transformation did not occur, of course, without a social context and without serving a larger political function. The same was true of the earlier intellectual innovations we have noted. The priors of Florence had declared as acceptable the traffic in Christian slaves, the traffic in Christian slaves, <laughs> who were of, quote, infidel origin, because to fail to do so might have undermined the slave trade with which the church was so profitably involved. And in. how you know they ain't talking about no uh religious you know old christian slave i mean my naga you read the papal bull you read the papal bull subjugate all enemies of christ right so they weren't subjugating uh you know tribes that were actually christians according to their latin you know christianity whatever their you know uh jc and all this stuff you know what i'm saying they were they were subjugating the enemies of their anointed. So these so-called Christian slaves, you know, they might as well put an historian on it. They might as well just put Hebrew Nagas. They said of infidel origin. Let's go. Because to fail to do so might have undermined the slave trade with which the church was so profitably involved in the Limpieza de Sangre, although initially inspired by religious hatred, soon became a valuable weapon of class struggle with which low-born Spanish Catholics could push their way into positions of authority that might otherwise be held by high-born persons of Jewish ancestry. Oh, let's read that part again. 
I like talking about ancestry. Although initially inspired by religious hatred, soon became a valuable weapon of class struggle. They're talking about the Limpieza de Sangre, S-A-N-G-R-E, a valuable weapon of class struggle with which low-born Spanish Catholics could push their way into positions of authority that might otherwise be held for high persons of Jewish ancestry. So what do the Jewish people have to do with the slave trade? And why are they in such high positions, right? Push their way into positions of authority that might otherwise be held by high-born persons of Jewish ancestry. Are they talking Hebrew? Or are they talking Jewish convert? If they're talking Hebrew, you know they're talking you, but you know ain't nobody holding no high positions for you at this time. Not when we're talking slave trade. Well, then why is the Jewish being held as a high-born person relative to the slave trade? The doctrine function as, let's back it up, as Eliot demonstrates in his discussion of the Limpieza, L-I-M-P-I-E-Z-A, look it up. The doctrine functioned as a compensating code for commoners, quote, with which might effectively challenge the code of the aristocracy, aristocracy. So this limpieza was some type of what they call compensating code, which might effectively challenge the code or function as a compensating code for commoners, which might effectively challenge the code of the aristocracy. After all, they would argue, was it not profitable or preferable to be born of humble but pure Christian parentage than to be a calibero of suspicious racial antecedents? antecedents. In neither of the cases, certainly, was the social or political or economic function of the race discrimination in question the sole and sufficient motivation for its being institutionalized. Each one drew for its, for its authorization on a deep well of centuries old and symbolically embedded antipathy for its targeted victims. Once in operation, however, the racially oppressive institution justified, reinforced, and thus exas exaggerated the negative racial stereotypes that had made the institution permissible in the first place, which in turn further satisfied the institution itself. In the late 15th and early 16th century, Spain and Spanish America, the primary economic context within which anti-Indian racial ideologies were cultivated and institutionalized, was the fe feverish hunt for gold. Here we go. We're about to be back on that cities of gold. Oh, 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 oh. Cities of gold. Estebanico. Oh, we on your ass, Esteban. Lego. Then later, as the 16th century wore on, the context changed to the mining of silver, which was available in much greater volume. Spain at this time, as noted earlier, was a nation with effectively no manufactured items to export. It was an exporter of raw materials and an importer of finished goods. Even within its own border, Spain was plagued by a stagnating economy with most local production intended for local consumption with this broad and, broad and mountainous terrain. Whatever goods were moved around were carried back by pack mules. And despite the presence of perhaps 400,000 such primitive beasts of burden, as an exchange economy, the nation was dormant. 
One consequence of this was both very small productive volume and great and a great deal of duplication along with a steady outflow of capital to those other European countries on which Spain was economically dependent. In contrast with its state of commercial impoverishment, however, 15th century advances in ship design, primarily of Portuguese inspiration, along with developments in pilotage, navigation, and cartography, and the persistence of old Christopher Christ of Ophir, Colombo, allowed Spain with its ideal geographic location to lead the way in exploration of the Indies. Thus, it came about that one of the European nations that could least afford to finance colonization abroad and that had a sudden overabundance of experienced mili military men within its midst due to the recent defeat of the Moors in Granada was given first entry into the new world. Let's read that last part again, man. Thus it came about that one of the European nations that could least afford finance colonization abroad and that had a sudden overabundance of experienced military men within its midst due to the recent defeat of the Moors. So something about, you know, this so-called defeat of the Moors, right, gave them an abundance, I'm sorry, an overabundance of experienced military men. <laughs> Due to the recent defeat of the Moors in Granada. Something about this more, uh, you know, Spain situation happening in 1492 gave them everything they need to pop off. You think they just got military men or did they get the drop? The drop on navigation, the drop on cartography. They got the maps, they got the secrets, man. They got the promised land. They got the coordinates. They got pieces of friendship. So what they call a defeat of the Moors in Granada led to overabundance of experienced military men. That they took where? So when they came over here, who was jumping off them boats? Experienced military men from the war in Granada with the Moor. Along with Christopher Columbus were experienced military Moors that had just lost a war in Granada. I mean, that's what they're saying. <laughs> Let's go. The stories of indescribable wealth available in the Indies to those who could seize it of river riverbeds filled with nuggets and of boulders that shattered and poured forth gold when struck with the club fired the imagination of individual adventurers, of course, but it did the same for religious and financial collective collectivities as well. The church now envisioned the wealth of the Indies, both in gold and in souls. Sound like Hijack City. They want souls and gold. Gold and souls. To harvest as the means for launching the final crusades. While wealthy nobles and merchants knew that the crown was in no position to direct the conquest and exploitation of the islands without deriving virtually all its financial backing from private sources. For about a dozen years from the launching of Columbus's second voyage in 1493 to the eve of the conquest of Jamaica, Cuba, and Puerto Rico after 1506, the capital behind the provisioning of ships and stores and mercenary soldiers was raised 
by merchants and noble partnerships within Spain. From 1506 forward, however, the conquest of the rest of the Caribbean was financed by the gold that was taken from Hispaniola. In 1499, after the great majority of the islands, millions of people, millions of people had been destroyed. The long dreamed of gold mine was discovered on Hispaniola. We're talking at Haiti. ID. But, yeah, man, shout out to the you know, tribe and IED producing for a time between three and six tons of gold per year. Per year. They found you with milk and honey in the promised land. They found you with pearls and gold. Milk and honey is pearls and gold. And who led them here? Oh, these um, experienced uh, military men from the Granada War, defeat of the Moor. Or are we just talking Moab? This is the Maracan. Holocaust. Hey, school's out for this uh, blackness, for this African Americanness. You're gonna have to show up, and you're gonna have to take accountability for the tribe that you are. And the vibe that you want. And if you don't know, hey man, hey, don't be afraid to show a little A high for a while, KTC, and you all right with me. But if you do know, ride with it and come correct, because the truth got you surrounded in that wall. <laughs> That mem song. Shout out Yosef for that Tokef Benak. Heating it up, man. Five Eyes Madrick and How I Die. Thinking out loud. Hey, shout out to Yohanna Die. The Hebrew Prince, man. We litty in the city. Drop city, that is, man. Let's get some more of this, man. So, we got some gold mines and ID producing between three and six tons of gold per year. Similarly, writes Ralph Davis, while the first attempts to settle the mainland coast were organized by from Spain, the series of expeditions after 1516, which culminate in Cortez's conquest of Mexico, were backed by Cuban resources. Cuban resources. What's a Cuban resource? Stuff they're stealing from Cuba. Stuff they're stealing from our family. And they're taking that and they're financing more chaos, my knock. More invasion. What does the papal bull say? Invade, search out, vanquish enemies of their Christ. So what were you connected with? If they have to introduce you to their Christ, what were you connected with? Well, I guess that seems to be the problem. What should you have been connected with? What should we have been connected to? Only. Hawa! Allah Hawa. We KTC. So they got the Cuban resources in 1516, Cortez and them, and the wealth of Mexico paid for the northward and southward extension of exploration and gave some backing to the colonization of Panama in the Isthmus, Isthmus and later and a decade later to the conquest of Peru. Thus, one after another, Caribbean and American locales were raided and drained of their wealth. Nagas were drained of their wealth, a portion of which was divided among the crown. What crown? You ain't talking about the real royal. You ain't talking about Preston John. 
What crown? Who got the crown? Hijack city. Divided. Just like the scripts say, our lot was divided among the heathen. They cast lots, right? A portion of which was divided among the crown and the conquistadors, invaders, who provided the conquistadors financial support. While the rest was used to mount further D depredations. Now back up. Who gave financial support? The crown. What was the crown looking like in 1516? Oh, Charlesy? We're still talking Charles Kento? Black ass King Charles, man? Yeah, you got a black king in Spain, man. You got a black king in Spain in 15, in the, you know, early 1500s, my night. Yeah. Oh, King Charles. Uh-huh. So we got Moors and Granada that get defeated on, on paper. This is what they say. Moors and Granada get defeated. Then they got an overabundance of of military men <laughs> that are of course black right <laughs> moors from granada right so now they get an overabundance of military men that's the story whatever it takes man whatever it takes to make y'all feel better whatever it takes to cover up the fact that our own people that look just like us are the ones that invaded us what do they say like esteban that's the first thing they say Oh, well, he was just a slave that was, you know, leading uh, these conquistadors, you know, Marcus, Marcos de Nisa and them, you know, Coronado and them. But nah, Marcos de Nisa and Coronado were also melanated Manag. Oh, yeah. It's a full on melanated invasion. Esteban's melanated. King Charles, melanated. Colombo melanated. How and if they say Esteban's the first non-native to enter New Mexico into the Howie Cusi Bola complex, Zuni complex, that means that no other tribe, even if he was melanated, outside of that tribe right there in Howie Ku, Hawaku in New Mexico, so called. No other tribe melanated or not was going through there like that. So that can't be part of the Morocco in the mind of the more of America being some old Morocco. I mean, did that not affect how we could? Did, it, did that not affect New Mexico? Or are you just claiming little territories and casting lots again because the children of Lot are unhappy with their lot? See, the children of Hawakwab, Jacob, you know what I'm saying? We were given very nice lots, you know. Our issue was that, you know, we didn't KTC. You know, we got out of order with it. We got, uh, you know, overly confident, you know, that we can rock without our source, which will never happen again, even though they've done everything to make sure that this Ruach Tardy Ma is forever. But is it forever, Managi? Is it forever? It appears to be a more and more war, man. And you follow this. This is 1500s. 200 years later, you're popping off the coon saying it, right? So then they're doing the treaties, you know, the Choctaw and all that. You, I mean, you, you dig on it. So we just paint a clear picture. Don't mind us. Surfing the wave in the Amaro Khan Holocaust. What picture do you see, my nigga? What picture do you see coming clear as we, you know, get our sight back? Because they did a whole lot of jam up Jones and they did a whole lot of jam up Jones and while we were asleep. Now you see real ones popping off all over the place, man. <laughs> Kwame Brown's over there. He got his 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 full Dracon Phineas on their head bow, man. Goodness gracious. Everybody being lit up, man, by this Dracon fire so we can see clearly 
Hey, man, I'm riding that wave, man. <laughs> hey, we surfing that wave, man. The, the wave of reality over here. I'm like, what? So we got 15, 16 Cuban resources. The wealth of Mexico. All right. That pays for this northward and southward extension of exploration and gave some backing to the colonization of Panama. All right. Then 10 years later or so, you got the conquest of Peru. And then it says, thus one after another, Caribbean and American locales were raided. Caribbean and American homes, Caribbean and American Nagas. American Nagas were invaded, raided. And drained of their wealth. Now we in the hoods and the ghettos. Acting like. You know. Oh. We get money. We act like it's new to us. When it, it's never been new. They they drain the Naga of. The Naga's wealth. man. You know what it's like to wake up wealthy. Not rich. Wealthy. <laughs> you know what it's like to wake up with so much. That you just can't get rid of it. In Anaga's mind, we just said, man, we, we got so much land and gold. You see how they're pulling out six tons of gold per year? That's just out of, in Haiti. I mean, just imagine everywhere, man. Come on, man. I mean, when you got it all, when you got generational wealth, you feel like nothing could take it away. And then Hawa says, man, I'm going to make you say one day that, yeah, I am the Lord, right? Hawa is Hawa. I am that I am because we never thought all this could be taken away from us. Hawa had to humble us and we say, yeah, you you are Hawa. Allow Hawa because we just got a, a, a real wakey, a real wakey wakey. You know what I'm saying? We never thought it could be taken away. We never thought our titles could be taken away. We never thought anybody could fade us. We never thought, you know what I mean? But Psalms 83, Confederacy. So that the name of Israel is remembered no more. Drained of their wealth. A portion which was divided among the crown, the conquistadors, and those who provided the conquistadors financial support while the rest was used to mount further depredations, by and large, the Spanish were uninterested in building new world colonial societies, but rather in draining the new world of its wealth. Well, really? What do you think the colonial societies will be doing? <laughs> Either way, they're going to be leeching on the Naga. Either way, they're going to be vanquishing and, 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 and stealing all the Nagas movable and immovable goods. Papu Boo, Doom Diverses, 1452. They took your movable and immovable goods. That includes your gold. <laughs> includes your things. Includes your stuff, man. We're getting our stuff back. Where's my staff, man? <laughs> Let's go. Indeed, notes Davis, by the 1570s, the investment movement had been reversed and returning colonists were investing capital accumulated in America entirely Spanish financial and industrial enterprises so now they ball now they got an enterprise now Spain has an enterprise that's built on the gold of Cuba that's built on the gold of Mexico. That's built on the gold of IED. And all throughout the Caribbean. All the family. The first waves of Spanish violence. Denuded. The Caribbean of its wealth in gold. And as we saw earlier. Of its wealth in people as well. Once the islands were thus made barren. The Spanish found goals to pursue elsewhere. And moved on. Like conquering the promised land. There were about 8,000 Spaniards living on Hispaniola in 1509. For instance, forcing the few surviving Indians to produce the remaining dregs of gold 
that the white man hungered for, but within a decade only a few hundred Spaniards remained to begin slowly building sugar plantations on the backs of growing numbers of imported African slaves. Stop! So these same Spaniards, after taking all the gold, they say, now they got a little bit left. They got the Nagas mining that for these whites now, right? But within a few decades, within a decade, only a few hundred Spaniards remained to begin slowly building sugar plantations. Okay. Beginning to begin building sugar plantations. I just want to think about that. Because from my recollection, last time that I checked, these hijacks coming off the boat, according to the story, they couldn't farm. They had to be taught how to farm, right? So any type of sugar plantation, so-called, that you find in, any type of crops you find in, must have already been here. Must have already been here. Or, you know what I'm saying, you, you do know how to cultivate something you know brothers that look like us <laughs> that aren't us but they look like us maybe they do and they just you know started commandeering all these nagas homes and turning them into plantations or they found you and just turned you into a slave on your own land and made you pick the cotton and the sugar and everything else that you was already cultivating I mean, which one do y'all think, you know, jives with the story, the real story? But we know it's not on the backs of the imported African slaves when it was on the backs of the Nagas already here. Not only had the island's gold supply been depleted and its millions of native people effectively exterminated by then, but most of those who had done the exterminating had left for richer fields of exploitation. Davis describes well the pattern that was repeated for decades still to come for the dismount. Many of the early conquistadors shared in the gold finds from the small ones in the islands to the hoard in the treasure house in Atahualpa. The astounded Pizarro's followers that astounded Pizarro's followers in 1533. So, man, they, they found a bunch of gold in 1533 that astounded them. Yet these hordes were quick, quickly distributed, and when the king's share and the leader's big portions have been taken out, few rank and file soldiers secured enough to take home to the longed for life of luxurious idleness in Castile. The followers and hanger, hangers on of the conquistadors restless and unreliable material for permanent colonial settlements were therefore constantly on the move to seek fresh opportunities of fortune. The opening of Cuba rapidly drained Española of most of its Spanish population after 1513. News of the entry to the mainland ac accelerated this exodus after 15. 17 and it turned into a stampede from all the island settlements when Cortez secured a firm grip on the Aztec Empire in 1521. Again, they trying to <laughs> they got the gold and moved on to the actual mission at hand, Managa, which was <laughs> to get America, man. To get the promised land because hey, Hey, hindsight's twenty twenty. I mean, look at where you at now. Or, you know, you always been here, but look at where they're at now. <laughs> and, you know, now they just blend in. They call themselves Americans. You know, they got all these riches from them, from, you know what I'm saying, the the Nagas already here. You know, all these riches from the, the Nagas already holding down, you know what I'm saying, Kalelus. And they take them riches turn it into all these fancy areas today and, you know, have all these fancy homes and 
all this stuff. And you're like, how did you come up like this? Because of business? Because, I mean, how did you even get in that business? How did you become such oil typhoons and all this stuff? Because of this time period. This is how they came up. They had nothing until they found you. They had nothing, my naga, until they found you. Until Cortez secured a firm grip on the Aztecs. Ute Aztec. And we're talking Judah. Mexico. Mesh. Meshi. But the palace and the temple hordes of Tenochtitlan were not adequate to satisfy the cravings of all the Spaniards who followed Cortez. Large numbers of them pushed on under other leaders into the jungles that separated Mexico from the little colony of the Panama Isthmus over vast desert plateaus towards California, south to Colombia where gold mines were found by Quesada in 1537 and above all after 1532 to the new Bonanza in Peru. Every township established by the Spaniards in Mexico, with the exception of Mexico City and perhaps Veracruz, lost most of its Spanish population within a few years of its foundation. During these years, and especially after the Inca fabulous, quote, Silver Mountain of Potosi, P-O-T-O-S-I, was discovered by the Spanish, Spanish and converted through the importation of forced Indian mine labor into the most populous, quote, city in the entire Spanish empire. Vast sums of wealth flow back to Spain from the Americas. So they drained the Naga to form their world. You ever see, uh, you know, Transformers? I don't know if it's part one or something, but, you know, um, Krypton, not Krypton, <laughs> Superman Transformer. You know what I mean? Uh, whatever the other uh, planet is, you know, it, it has to like, destroy the earth, you know, has to drain the earth of his resources, drain the earth of his life force just for it to form. It has to drain your world for them to form their world, right? Same thing today with all this tenderoni. They got to shatter your world to form a new world, right? Out of chaos comes order, new world, right? How many of your worlds have been destroyed and what does it take to rebuild? Uh, you know, Hawa says, uh, you know, once we KTC, <laughs> we back. Do you believe that? Managa, we about to find out. This was the American Holocaust. Hawa. Yeah, man. 